And in upstate New York, there is a chapel in memory of a man whose apocalyptic message was so powerful it endures today in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. William Miller was a farmer. By studying the Bible, he felt he could unlock the secret to when Christ would return. His message was based on his interpretation of some very difficult passages in the book of Daniel. By linking Daniel and Revelation, Miller calculated that a divine countdown of 2,300 years had begun in 457 BCE. Subtracting 457 from 2,300 brought him to the year 1843. Now, in one sense, it's not too surprising that, you know, after all of these calculations and after all of this elaborate study, inevitably each new interpreter comes along and says, it's only a year or two from now. But that's exactly what Miller does and what he concludes. In 1839, Miller hooks up with Joshua Himes, who has a whole publicity machine. And Himes put his printing press and his whole public relations machinery at Miller's disposal. And at that point, we can begin to see the Millerite movement coming into existence. They soon numbered more than a quarter million. They were ordinary Americans. Many of them were involved in other reform movements. Uh, Joshua Himes in Boston, for example, was also involved in the abolitionist movement. People were drawn to Miller out of a larger cultural climate of the moment. And they were not cranks. They were not fringe people. Uh, they were ordinary Americans who found his interpretation compelling. Miller predicted that Christ would return sometime between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844. As the time went on and nothing yet happened, the crowds got even larger. Uh, New Year's of 1844 comes along and the sense of expectation is great. Nothing happens. Finally, we get to March of 1844, the end of what he, he thinks of as the window of the second coming. And even then, it doesn't come. Miller's followers refused to accept failure. They went back to the drawing board, and they realized that they had made an error of one year by neglecting to take into account the transition from B.C. to A.D., they settled on October 22nd, 1844. The more people they convinced of the new date, the less their earlier disappointment seemed to matter. The momentum was building. Huge crowds began gathering on the strange formation at Miller's farm they called Ascension Rock. As the fateful night approached, they prepared themselves. Millerite farmers left their fields unharvested. Others sold all their earthly possessions in anticipation of the end. Miller creates the conditions then for an incredible letdown, incredible sense of disappointment. It would be remembered by one Millerite as the great disappointment. Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted. And such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. We wept and wept until the day dawned. It really was a literal event that they anticipated. And when it doesn't happen, it, it's really a, an existential crisis, I think, for many thousands of Americans. And yet, the chapel built in Miller's memory is strong testimony that despite overwhelming disproof, faith in this notion of Bible prophecy remains unshaken.
In the 1840s, a British minister devised a new system that laid the foundation for many forms of modern apocalyptic expectation. His name was John Nelson Darby. Darby's prophetic system retains Miller's basic expectation that the coming of Christ is going to be soon, and then the thousand-year kingdom will commence. But he develops the notion of a great parenthesis, that is, a pause in the divine clock. And the clock will only start again when the second coming is near. Darby christened this moment the rapture. The rapture is the term that he coins. That term doesn't exist in the Bible at all. He creates it. It's Darby's way of describing what will happen the first time that Jesus returns, when he snatches away the elect from the earth. The doctrine of the rapture is a tremendous breakthrough in the history of prophetic teaching because with it, Darby uh, avoided uh, the problem of the Millerites, the problem of, of date setting. Uh, but at the same time, the doctrine of the rapture holds believers in a state of constant readiness. They could be snatched from the earth literally at any moment. It was Darby's genius to invent a system of prophecy interpretation which still survives in almost the same form today and without any significant changes. For the trumpet of the Lord shall sound. John Hagee is a well-known televangelist. And we shall be changed all over the earth. Homes of believers will have the supper dishes on the table. The food will be on the stove, but the occupants are mysteriously and suddenly gone. The headlines will be screaming, millions are missing, the church has been raptured. 